Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson one of the so-called Hello World series of my MIPS assembly programming tutorials. What's the Hello World series? Well, it's the series in which we make a Hello World example. Well, pretty obvious, really. Today, we're going to make that Hello World example on the N64. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go through all of the stages of creating the example today. We're going to look at all of the parts that we have to compile together. We're going to look at the assembly script that I'm using to build, and we're going to see it running on the emulator like this. So this is the basic example, and we've also got a more advanced version which shows some simple monitor tools that will allow us to do some simple debugging and also just basically learning about how the system works. So let's go over to out of the screen and let's see the source code. Okay, so this is the file that we're looking at today, N64 Hello. Now, um, as the text up there just said, you can download the examples and also the build script from my website, so you'll be able to run this from home, hopefully. Okay, so the first thing we're doing here is we are telling our assembler what we're actually doing. Now, the assembler I'm using is the ARMIPS assembler, which does ARM and MIPS, I believe. So um, this, this is the one that we're using, and so this one we are actually telling the kind of ROM file we are building for. So N64 means Nintendo 64, PSX means PlayStation, and this is configuring the um, assembler and defining how it creates its data. The N64 is a big Endian system, the PlayStation is a little Endian, so some things will need switching around and the, the assembler is being told to do that. Now the next thing we're doing is we're defining the file we're actually going to output. We're doing this in the source rather than on the command line, which is a bit odd for me, but that's the way we're doing it. So we're directly building the N64 cartridge here. We're doing almost all of the work within this file itself. So what we're doing here is we are specifying the starting address of the cartridge. Now, this is the address that the data starts, not the actual program. So the, the cartridge actually starts with a header, which you can see just below here. This is data here. And we're defining the origin of this data here with this org statement. So that is the first address that will be present within our cartridge. Now, at the end of our cartridge, we have a footer. Um, basically, we've got some code here which is just padding it to an 8 megabit boundary here. So this is creating a valid cartridge size here. And then we've got a close command just to, to end the, the file. So that will create the file. Now, a header um, basically has a, a few sort of defined bytes. Um, most of them are pretty fixed here. We've got a pointer to the start of our code here. This is the program start. So this is a label and you can see the actual code is down here. Now, after that, we do have a, a CRC, which is a um, checksum, basically. It's a calculated um, pair of words that are calculated from the contents of our cartridge. And you'll notice we've left them zero. Um, this is not actually OK. Um, the emulator we're using today would actually not run this if they weren't correct. And the way we're going to fix that is um, I use a batch file to run my program. And we're running a program called RN64CRC. And this will basically patch the N64 cartridge file that we're building here with uh, that correct checksum. So um, this this assembly file isn't enough to create a runnable program quite. We just need to patch in that correct checksum. But apart from that, everything will be OK. So we've got a name of our program. This is just my website name. And we've got some generic things. The country code, which I've got set to Japan, because I live in Japan. So that's what we've got there. And this is the basic header that defines the cartridge itself. Now, th that isn't enough to start the cartridge. Even with our program code, that isn't enough. Now, there is a bootstrap that we run as part of the initialization of the cartridge. And this, I believe, sets up a lot of the sort of um, fundamentals of the system itself. Now, I, I have had a look, and basically, the bootstrap that we've got here is a, uh, is a, a binary file, and this is taken from an official game. So basically, um, there seem to be a just relatively few different bootstraps that people used. I have seen there were multiple different ones in the commercial games, but a lot of them used the same generic one. And so um, I'm not going to tell you which game this came from, but this is an official, unfortunately, an official cartridge ROM boot file here. Um, I, I guess I could disassemble it and try and work out what it does, but I think it's extremely complicated. So that's not something I fancy doing. 4,032 4, bytes is going to be about 4,000 ASM commands. So it's not going to be pretty pleasant to disassemble, to be honest. So anyway, so we've got that there. And then what we've got is our actual program start. And we're going to then start setting up the system according to our requirements. 
Now the first thing we've got here is, um, is the various register settings for our screen. Now there's an awful lot of these and I'm not going to go into them partially because I don't think it's particularly relevant, partially because I don't entirely understand what they all do. However, suffice to say that they set up the screen for us. We're setting up a 16 bit per pixel, that's two bytes per pixel screen that is um, about 320 by 240. I say about because parts of that area are not visible on the screen. There's a few lines missing from the top so um, that's uh, it's not entirely visible. The VRAM base is at this memory address here, A01000000. So that, that's the, the, the VRAM base. And if we started writing bytes to that area, we're going to start seeing pixels on the screen, with the exception that, as I say, a few lines are actually missing there. So this has set up our screen. And we, once this ends, we now have a, a basically usable screen. Now, the example today, we're going to draw our characters to the screen to print our Hello World message, and we're going to print them character by character. The way I do my tutorials is always the same. Um, as soon as I've got something remotely usable, I then start writing my own Hello World example. I write a character drawing routine, if possible, with my own font, and then I use that character drawing routine to build into other routines, like a print string routine, a monitor to show the contents of the registers, and a mem dump to show contents of the memory, and then I use those for whatever else I'm trying to do that day. You know, if I'm trying to test the joystick, I might want to mem dump the, um, the, the, the joystick registers, or I may want to load them into the system registers and then show those to the screen. So that's how I always do things, and so what I need is a cursor X and a cursor Y position for the next draw position for the next character on the screen. So these are going to be one byte parameters. And so we're just defining the offsets for cursor X and cursor Y in bytes. And we're defining those as offsets to an area of RAM that we're defining as user RAM, so RAM for our programs. And so that's just some memory that is free for us, and we're going to be using that. OK. So what we'll do next is we'll see the actual commands that our example today is going to run, and then we'll break down those commands. We're going to run a clear screen routine. That's going to clear the screen. Very, very unsurprising there. And then we're going to run a print string routine. And that's going to show the string pointed to by A0, which we're loading with the pointer to text. Now, the text message is hello world. And in my tutorials, I, I've always sort of come to use a character 255 as an end of line. I know you may prefer character 0. A lot of people do. But I've used 255 so far. And so I'm going to finish my tutorials using 255. So if you want 0, you can just change the checks for 255 to checks for 0 if you prefer. OK, so we're doing that. We're then performing a new line command. That's just basically zeroing the x position and increasing the y position. And then just so that we can see that our program hasn't crashed, we're printing the same string to the screen again. And then we've got a jump to an infinite loop. That will just happen forever. That's just an, an endless delay, just so we can see the results of our example there. So this is our simple example. We also have our more advanced example. This has some more functions, a little bit more complicated. And it will basically, it's, it's basically the same kind of thing. But we are now dumping the contents of the system register to the screen and also an area of memory. The reason, as I say, is just so you've got something to build on if you're trying to do something a little bit more complicated than get the message, hello world, onto the screen. But uh, as I say, they both are basically functionally very similar. OK. Well, let's take a look at the clear screen routine. So this is going to be our first time that we're going to be drawing data to the screen. Now, our screen memory, as we've set it up, starts at this memory address here. And so basically, if we write a 16-bit value to uh, th this kind of range, then it will appear on the screen, with the exception of, as I say, the first few bytes are not visible on the screen. But what we're going to do here is we're going to basically clear the entire screen. The visible screen is 320 pixels by 240 pixels. So we're loading T3 with a pixel count. We're loading T4 with a color. Now, this is the color that we want to clear our screen. So our color at each pixel is 16 bits. And this is the format. There's basically five bits for red, five bits for green, five bits for blue, and then one unused bit there. So that is the definition of the color that we're going to clear the screen. This is a sort of a, a darkish blue. You can kind of see it over here. So that's the, the color we're going to clear. So our clear screen routine is just basically storing that color to the, to the position T5 and adding 2 to T5. So moving through the VRAM, T5 is the VRAM destination there, basically until our counter reaches 0 here. 
So that's just clearing all of the pixels on the screen in a very simple routine. So we're, we're working in halves here. We could work in words and clear two pixels at once, but I, I thought for clarity, I wanted to do it in pixels. So that's what we've done there. So that's cleared the actual data. And the final thing we're going to do is we're going to reset the position of our cursor X and cursor Y. So we're loading the pointer to user RAM to T7 here. And then we are clearing the cursor X and cursor Y here by loading a zero value in bytes to both of those. And then we're just simply returning by jumping to the return address. So that's how we do our clear screen. Let's take a look at our print string routine. So we have loaded in the pointer to this address here. And we're going to basically, um, what we're doing here is we are storing the return address onto the stack. That is the equivalent of a push command. The reason we're doing that is we're calling the print char subroutine and that will also change the return address. At the end of our subroutine, we're restoring the return address here and jumping to it to return. And then in between that, we are loading in a single unsigned byte from the A0 registered address here. So that is the character that we want to show. And then we are just comparing that to 255. If that character is 255, then we're done. And so in that case, we're just returning. Otherwise, we're printing that character to the screen with the print char routine, and then we're repeating until basically we get to that 255. So there better be one somewhere or there will be trouble. Okay, so that's how we are printing our string. And so all of the work is being done by the print char routine. And that's what we're going to take a look at now. Now, in my original tutorials, I was actually using a 16-bit font. So each, um, each character in that font was basically defined by eight lines of eight pixels and two bytes per pixel. However, in my tutorials, I've kind of come up with a sort of um, a standard, if you will, that I always use a one bit per pixel font, a black and white font. And so basically, um, I've got that font defined here. So this is a 96 character font. Each font is eight lines tall, eight pixels wide. And because it's only black and white, that's one byte per line. And so we're going to convert each line of our font into pixel data and draw it to the screen. A little bit more tricky in some ways, but um, as I say, um, this means that this is consistent with my other tutorials. So um, that's what we're going to do. Okay. So what we're going to do first is we're going to work out what character we're actually being asked to draw. We've been passed an ASCII character in A1. However, our font doesn't contain a full ASCII character set. The first character is character 32 space. So we're subtracting 32 from the character we've been asked to draw. And then we're going to multiply that by eight with that shift left logical, shifting it by three bits there and then adding that to the base my font. That is effectively calculating the correct offset within our font for the character we've been asked to show. So we now know where our source data is. What we're going to do next is we're going to calculate our VRAM destination. So well, how are we going to do that? Well, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate our X position multiplied by 16. Y 16? Well, there's eight pixels per character and there's two bytes per pixel. So that's 16 bytes per character. So we're multiplying the X position by 16 here. And we are basically adding that to the VRAM base. Now the VRAM base is this address here. However, we're skipping a few pixels here because the first lines weren't actually visible. If we wrote to address zero, it would be completely off the screen. So we're just correcting that for that. And then what we're doing here is we are multiplying our Y position by the number of bytes in an eight pixel tall strip basically one full strip of characters here. So there's 320 pixels wide on the screen. There's two bytes per pixel and there's eight lines per strip of our characters. And so that is the value that we're multiplying our Y position by. And then we're adding that to our VRAM base as well. So we've added the X and the Y position to this address here. So we've now calculated our VRAM destination. We've also calculated our font source. And so all we're going to do now is transfer pixels the, from the bits in our font source to our VRAM destination. That's what we're going to do now. So T2 is our Y line count and T1 is our pixel count. And what we're doing here is we're reading in a full byte from T6, which is our font. Now that byte will contain eight pixels. So we're going to use the individual bits in T3 here. Okay, so let's get started. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to load T4 with the value of the pixel if the pixel is not good to, to be set. So this is blue, this is our background here. And then what we're doing here is we are testing the leftmost pixel within the data that we loaded in from our font. So we're testing a single bit here. And if that is zero, then we're going to skip over the next line and just draw the pixel because the next line is going to set T4 to the colored 
version, the yellow that we're going to fill if the pixel in our font wants to be set. Either way, we're going to store that half to the screen here. So that is storing either the filled pixel if the bit was one in the font or the blue pixel if the bit was zero in the font. We're then going to move across our VRAM destination by two bytes. We're then going to shift our source font data to the left by one, one bit there. And then we are going to basically repeat for the next pixel across the screen. And so the we previously tested the top bit. We're now going to test the top bit less one because we've shifted all the bits to the left. And we're going to repeat until we've done the entire, entire line of the source data. Once we've done that, we're then going to move down one full line of the screen. So we've, we've moved across eight pixels already. So that's why we're subtracting eight from the 320 width there. We're multiplying that by two because there's two bytes per pixel. And we're then going to decrease our Y line count. And we're going to keep doing that until we're done. So that is how we're drawing our character to the screen. And that's how we get our Hello World example. Let's just see it one last time here. OK. So there's our Hello World example. So that's how we've got that to the screen. OK, so that's how we've built our source example. How do we actually compile it? Well, it's not too hard. Um, I have this script here, and a lot of it is kind of redundant. I've got some extra tricks in here to check for mistakes. And I, I have a sort of um, script for repeatedly building the same file, even if I'm assembling a different file, things like that. But we're going to look at the fundamentals, the bits you really need. So I'm using this RMIPS assembler here. And, and basically, we need to specify a source file. Now, in the case of my um, batch file here, that would be this build file, percent build file here. So that would be your hello.asm or something here in your examples if you're just running this from the command line. Now, I'm specifying to output a listing file here. Now, you don't need to do that. A listing file is for debugging. In the early stages, if you don't have a listing file, it's probably not going to matter to you too much. But later on, you might have problems and data isn't working quite as you'd expect. Maybe you've loaded a font, you can't find it, and you know the data doesn't seem to show to the screen. And you might need to check if things are actually being uh, assembled into the resulting binary in the way you expect. Maybe um, the labels haven't got the values you expect them to have, or maybe there's an alignment issue. And the, the listing file will help you out there. So I'd suggest you make one if you can. But if you can't, in the early days, it won't matter because you probably won't understand it anyway. So it's just something to bear in mind, really. Now, the other thing is um, I'm defining, uh, this is calling it a label, but it's effectively a symbol. I'm defining build n64 to the value of one. Now, what this does is it creates that on from the command line. And I use this in my multi-platform code. I have programs that will compile to the N64 or the PlayStation. And there's conditional sections of code that, that will only assemble if one of these um, defined symbols, either build N64 or build PSX, is defined. And so by having this on the command line, it means the command line is doing all of that work. Again, not necessarily something you need in your own code, but it, I, I wanted to tell you about it anyway. Now, the important thing is, as I said, is um, the uh, I'm using this Mupen64 uh, emulator here to run my cartridge. And that will not run the cartridge if the checksum is incorrect. So we need to create a valid checksum. And the way I'm doing it here is with this iron 64 CRC program, which isn't something I wrote, but it's something that does the job very nicely. And that will just basically patch in. It will calculate and then patch in the correct, um, the correct checksum for the cartridge. And that is the last part of this of the building this so there we go so that's um, all we're covering today if you like what you've seen please like and subscribe we're going to be doing more in 64 basic examples later and of course as i said before as well go to my website and download the source code and the build scripts and please have a go with this yourself because i want you to um i wanted to make your own stuff and have fun with it and you know come up with better stuff than i can do because um, these are just simple examples they're just really designed to get you started hope you enjoyed what you've seen today thanks for watching and goodbye